Okay, so welcome to our Kamena Wildlife Habitat Project um, programs. We've been doing third Wednesday of the month programs since January 2003. So tonight we're starting our 20th year of doing programs on the third Wednesday of the month. So thanks for coming. And before we get started with learning about native plants, I just want to tell you a little bit about our project. So um, here we go. So Kameno Wildlife Habitat is a community wildlife habitat certified by the National Wildlife Federation. And we now have 1,009 certified wildlife habitats on the island. So we achieved our 1,000 goal and now we're working on 1,100. So this is how um, it came about. If you look at the um, map there, in 1984, there was a fair amount of greenery. And looking at it in 2020, it's um, not as green. And so rather than thinking about, oh, this is very sad and watching the logging trucks roll off the island and being um, and sobbing, this is our action step to do things in our own backyards and kind of reconnect corridors. So it's um, not so hard to do if you look, this is my yard. And so when we moved to Kameno, we had, um, you know, a nice, uh, we live at the bottom of the hill there. So up here is where our garage is and our, our yard, front part of the yard, and then there's more behind um, the car. And um, so that's 1996. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner, that one is 2006, 2007. So we didn't um, landscape for wildlife all at once. We kind of did it in pieces. And then this is today, and you, you can't really you view the water kind of through the trees, and it's a wildlife habitat, and lots of ground cover, lots of shrubs, and, and tall trees, and short trees. So it's um, it's gone from being real open and almost sterile, except for we do have our cedar tree there, into something that is really refreshing on a hot sunny day. So our neighbors on both sides, they have grass. And when they, when I go up the stairs into the lawn part of our yard, it's I look over there and think, oh man, that looks pretty dry and, and hot, but I'm very refreshed in my yard. So. And if people do this kind of thing in the yard in, in, in steps, you know, it doesn't all happen at once, then we are reconnecting corridors or that's the hope. A lot of yards doing a lot of landscaping for wildlife and then it's not so bleak and not just sterile lawns. So to do it, it's a matter of providing food, water, shelter and places to raise young. And also it's it's beyond just doing the, the planting, it's also thinking about um, responsible gardening or sustainable gardening. So on the island, reducing lawn is also a good thing because we get our water from the groundwater. And so our aquifers need to be replenished rather than to just have all the water go back into Puget Sound. So growing natives is quite easy on the island because it's a matter of keeping things rather than taking them out. And it's conserving water and you really don't have to do much. So in our yard, we, we have to uh, cut cut a little bit to get through the trail now and then. But other than that, it, it's just lush and plentiful. And it's a matter of thinking of it as a work in progress versus something that is needs to be done all at once. So there's lots of good reasons to have a wildlife habitat. And the best one is just, it's just so pleasant to um, to be in it. You get your own little natural habitat and it's a bigger deal because we're connecting with other people doing it and that makes it a community action step because we're trying to uh, keep our island paradise. So it's simple to do with an application from the National Wildlife Federation. You just are provide, showing how you provide food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. You only have to tick off a couple of things, food, three little things, and you can do that all in plants. You don't have to put feeders up. And if you put feeders up, you get to watch and learn the birds, um, but you don't have to do that. If you do put them up, that means you need to keep them clean and and be a responsible bird bird feeder um, stalker. And the other so in the other columns just have 
a couple things to check off. And then the, the one on the right hand side, the second page, is how you're doing sustainable gardening. And this is a this is where this is all a work in progress. You don't have to be a purist when you start. You can um, you grow as you do it. So the idea is that you know some people might certify their yards and use chemicals in their yards and pesticides and that. And you know after a couple of years or so of doing that, and they realize you know if they really want to have those bird feeders out and they really want to have a landscape for wildlife, maybe they want to back off and be more. Um, responsible in, in what they're putting in the yard or, or what the plants people choose to buy. You can get this application on our website, CamanoWildlifeHabitat.org. You can also certify directly with the National Wildlife Federation by going to their website and just do it online. If you do use our application, which is the, their application with our address, then I count so I know that, well, then I'll know when we get to 1010 sooner rather than later. And so that is the scoop on that. I also stock applications at the library. So in the kiosk in front of the library, which is one of our demonstration gardens, as well as inside the library. Inside the library has our special Camino application and outside is generic. So you're sending it to Virginia before um, and we find out when we get our update from the National Wildlife Federation. Once you're certified, you can um, kind of be a, uh, a little promoter for us. And so we have our Camino Island sign, and I can get that to you. I can meet you at the library uh, or the parking lot at the um, Terrace Corner. And yet yeah, you need to be certified to get a sign. But if you put the sign up, then people in the neighborhood see it and they say, oh, yeah, I can do that. And so we, I get a lot of calls from people that see the signs and want to participate. Or you can get a Ranger Rick sign. That's the National Wildlife official sign um, right now. They've gone through a few transitions. So you'll see different signs um, on the island um, because there's various transitions of the National Wildlife Federation sign. But once you certify and have a certification number, you can get a sign to post. $15 for a wildlife habitat sign, $30 for the um, National Wildlife, and it all goes for a good cause. And this is our map. So this is all the dots spread across the island. And the whole idea is that we're restoring corridors. So it's kind of thinking that, you know, we've got lots of nice parks on the island, and state parks, our county parks and preserves. And if we do things in our yards, we can reconnect. And the idea is like you think of your yard as an area one, area two, area three. Area one's up close where you're at a lot. You might want to put bird feeders there so you can learn the birds and watch them. Area two, you're not around so much. Area three is the back part of your property. And if those area threes are kind of wild, they, they don't necessarily get a lot of traffic. And those area threes backing up to each other actually do restore corridors. And it can be a, it can be a, a small yard. Actually, you can certify a deck or a rooftop garden. They started out as a, uh, an urban um, thing for neighbor for people to do in the city. But we are doing it on a bigger scale on the island where we have people with acreage so that we can get people to really think about native plants and restoring corridors. And so you can see there are now, um, 18 community wildlife habitats on in Washington state, 144 in the nation. Kamena was the second in the state and the 10th in the nation. I went to a uh, regional retreat on Tuesday with all the different people from the communities, a Zoom retreat this year. And it, it's energizing to see all these different communities um, working to landscape for wildlife and share our space with the critters. and. It's, it's it's really quite quite a cool action step for communities. So for more information, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation website or our Camino Wildlife Habitat website, which is just wonderful. We Roxy redesigned it, and it's a, a joy to look at. And you can go and look at old programs. Our one on landscaping for drain fields that Scott Chase did is a hit. It has had over 800 um, looks at. So if you don't know about landscaping for drain fields, you can go look at that on our, going through our website. We have a YouTube channel that has our programs on. These are some references you can get. The two on the top, Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife, are written by Russell Link, who is a biologist with 
the state fish and wildlife department and so they're local pacific northwest and very handy resources and then the bottom one is from the national wildlife federation and with that welcome to our program thank you for um, starting out with us for our 20th years of, of programs on the island we will have our our february program is going to be about uh, how to know when uh, it's the, the babies coming out in the springtime and, and we'll follow educational director Shona Aitken is going Aitken is going to talk to us about um, being careful around the babies and when to know when when they need to be just left alone or when they've been abandoned and maybe need help from the from the rehabilitation center. So she'll talk about that. Then in March we will have a show about bird collisions uh, with the windows and then in April it's native plant month so we'll have another native plant show but for that I need to get into tonight's program so Mariah Thompson she is with the Snohomish Conservation District and she is the um, I have to get her title right. She's the Rest Restoration Project Assistant. She has a bachelor's degree from the University of Puget Sound, and it's a neat degree. She has it in environmental policy and decision making, as well as sociology and anthropology. And so with that, her, her goal was to kind of merge the environmental aspects of things with the, the stakeholders and the people involved so that um, changes for the environment um, are successful. Then she also uh, worked with Earth Corps and uh, both as a field crew as well in the field as a crew and then as a crew leader. And with that, she was helping people um, determine what sites were, what part of the habitat sites were good for restoration and, and how to go about doing that before they just tackled putting things in. And what I really liked, she talked about that she likes the smells of the um, the forest and the, and nature, and she likes the sweet smell of the Doug fir, and um, and I've been smelling this wonderful Doug fir now because during the slide, this beautiful eagle tree slid down the bank and is now um, 50 feet or so across the beach, just this majestic tree, and that's where people, um, if you are really thinking of how you can help habitat and have room for some dug fir and cedar and hemlock. The uh, our roost trees are are kind of sliding down the bank or are not not we're, we're that's one of our endangered species is our big trees and that's where uh, that would be a nice nice plants to think long term. That's the end of my spiel there and with that. Um, Oh, and the Snohomish Conservation District is having a sale, which Mariah will talk about, but their plant sale is coming up. And so with that, here is Mariah. And Hi, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Val, for that lovely introduction. Let's just get my presentation up. Does that look okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So I'm here today to talk about native plants and specifically how we can foster connection with our habitat and connection between ourselves and the habitat that we're in. So I'd like to thank Camino Wildlife Backyard Habitat Project for having me. And I'm really excited to share what I have. So what we'll cover today is an introduction to reciprocal restoration, which is an emerging ideology around how we approach restoration and how we do that sustainably and in a way that honors the other species that we coexist with. I'll also be talking about the importance of native plants and how they can provide habitat and then what constitutes wildlife habitat, which Val already touched on, but we'll go a little bit deeper. So first of all, what is a conservation district? We are a non-regulatory entity that is here to provide support to Snohomish County and also Camino Island. So that means that we're available for 
technical assistance and to help you find the best way to manage your land. We can provide support on planting along buffers and farm planning. We also offer educational opportunities and just a whole bunch of resources on our website. And really exciting, we have our native plant sale, which we'll have happening that all the plants that I mentioned in our presentation today will be available for sale at our native plant sale. So about me, as Val mentioned, I have a background in sociology and anthropology. And so my goal here is to bring in this humanistic approach to environmental work. I think when we approach environmental issues without considering the people in the environment, <laughs> we're really missing a big part of the picture. So my hope and dream is to heal our connection to our natural systems. And I'm excited to share how native plants can support wildlife and help us heal ourselves. So a lot of my philosophies around restoration stem from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And a lot of what I'll be sharing today is a reflection of her words and her knowledge. So I would just like to make that known that a lot of these ideas are with great influence and inspiration from her. So what is reciprocal restoration? This is the idea that for us to have successful restoration, it needs to be done in a mindful way. It's not an end all be all process. It's not a destination and it's constantly evolving to meet the needs of various species, which include ourselves. So we're not here to save the ecosystem, but rather work in tandem cohesively and collaboratively. I also think it's possible to find personal healing through creating relationships with the space that we exist in our relationship with the critters that we care for through mindfulness and how we plant the plants that we do and who we welcome besides ourselves. When I say creating habitat for all, I'm implying that we need to deconstruct the separation between humans and nature. Right now, there's this narrative that to protect natural spaces that we need to remove humans or prevent humans. But I think what we need is faith in our ability to do good and dismantle this thinking that humans are inherently selfish and destructive to habitat. This narrative has perpetuated the belief that nature is better off without us. And this, is, this type of thinking is essentially erasure to the native people that have been working collaboratively with the flora and fauna for time immemorial. So rather than think about how we can create these pristine natural spaces without human contact, we should think about how we can cultivate native plants and live in humble relation to the other species and by doing this, not only are we providing for wildlife, but we're also honoring the people that came to the land, that were on the land existing before colonizers arrived. I also think that native plants are not just for wildlife and they can simultaneously provide food and habitat while also providing humans with medicine. I think there's a way that this can be balanced and there is enough for everyone. So as we go through the presentation tonight, I think what we should keep in mind is prioritizing creating wildlife habitat, but also making a plant list that includes your needs, your interests, and the plants that can be healing to you as well. I think the more intentionality you put into your space, the more it will help wildlife and yourself flourish. So as Val mentioned, there's been increasing development on Camino Island, which makes increasing need for connectivity. So 
although we have large natural parks, it's clear that there's a lot of development going on, which makes it really important to have backyard wildlife habitat as a valuable source for nourishment and refuge for animals that are migrating between these spaces. They're already adapted to the climate and soils in this region. They're resistant to native pests and diseases. They require less water because they're used to the climate and they provide year round habitat because they've co-evolved with the other species surrounding them. It's already this cohesive system that's existed long before us. What do wildlife need? They need food, water, cover, and a place to raise young. So these are the four components that I'll be highlighting with various native plants that can provide these to the wildlife. So the first step in deciding what you need is to do a site assessment. So take some time, walk your yard, take notes. And this goes for if you have a small plot or if you have many acres, I think it's worth taking a, a, quite a bit of time to assess what animals are already there, who do you need to continue to support, and who would you like to attract? So having an idea of what is currently existing in your space, but also what you'd like to see and provide in the future. One thing you'll notice is the plants that are already there. So keep an idea of what you already have and make a list of what you'd like to see added in to create more diversity. It's important to pay attention to water on your property, where it flows, where it sits, and where it doesn't go. Pay attention to the soil. Is there an area that holds a lot of moisture or is consistently dry? Areas that are shady or sunny more consistently and areas that are more protected from wind. All of this information will help you narrow down a plant list that is specified to the various micro regions in your property, which will make it a lot easier for those plants to establish and start serving their, their needs. So I think a really simple planning tool is a good old fashioned drawing. I think technology is really helpful, but also there's a lot of creativity with just a pen and paper. If you are more tech savvy, there is this website called Yard Map that you can use. I did check and right now it seems that the Yard Map website is down. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but hopefully it's back soon in the future. But when it is up and running, it's really great because you can contribute to citizen science and provide data to other people in your region. So habitat elements, we have food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So the element that we'll be focusing on the most today is native plants as food, but we'll be touching on all of these. So I really, really love the Western Columbine. It is a plant that has a pretty diverse range. It can grow in sun to shaded sites and prefers moist soil, but also will do okay in dry soil. And its nectar is loved by butterflies and hummingbirds. And I think it's a really stunning plant to add to your landscape. Oregon stone crop is one of those drought tolerant hardy plants that provides year round cover for beneficial insects, which while pollinators are extremely important to all of our plants and food systems, beneficial insects are the smaller insects that are the main source of food for birds. So a lot of these plants will serve not just pollinators, but also as cover for these smaller insects that get less attention because they might seem less beautiful to people. Another plant, red flowering currant, 
which is utilized by so many different species. Hummingbirds and butterflies enjoy the nectar of their flowers in spring. Their leaves are forage for larvae of moths and butterflies and occasional browse for deer and elk. I also think red flowering currant is such a beautiful plant to add that brings a lot of spring color. It produces small currants, which are also valuable to birds. Salal is a plant that the Douglas squirrel, our native squirrel, really enjoy. Their light pink and white flowers attract hummingbirds, and it's a larval host for the brown elfin butterfly. This is a really hardy ground cover that provides year-round refuge for nesting habitat for songbirds and small mammals. Also, their berries are a good source of food for small mammals and birds. Next up, we have dull organ grape, also known as low organ grape. This is a plant that is also a year round evergreen and it has berries, which many birds really appreciate, including robins, waxwings, juncos, towhees, and sparrows. Painted lady butterflies are known to use the nectar. It also produces berries, which are not only used by the birds, but also a lot of just smaller mammals like to munch on those. You'll also notice that it's called low or dull organ grape. It has a very closely related tall organ grape, which is more popular with pollinators and butterflies. Vine maple is a shrub that provides really beautiful fall foliage and has seeds that the squirrels will harbor for winter. It has these really pretty flowers that I think a lot of people don't notice. I think when people think trees and shrubs, they often think that they just have leaves, but these also have flowers that are really important to pollinators. The songbirds rely on these deciduous shrubs for nesting cover, which is really helpful for them because it keeps them safe and keeps their nest out of sight. The birds will forage on the insects that feed on the foliage. So again, although insects are really overlooked, they're really important for birds because a lot of birds, even if they eat seeds and berries and nuts primarily as adults, most birds rear their young on insects. Next, we have the big leaf lupine, which again, another really stunning flower. It's not just for alpine landscapes. This flower is really important to pollinators. It has a special value to bumblebees, hummingbirds, and butterflies. Pacific Bleeding Heart is a really nice ground cover for those shady spots that don't get much sun. It provides year-round cover for amphibians and other insects, and its flowers serve butterflies and other pollinators. I also want to put a spotlight on goldenrod and aster. There is a chapter in Braiding Sweetgrass about how the author wants to know, they scientifically want to investigate why do these two flowers look so stunning together? And they're told that that's not a scientific inquiry and that they should go to art school. Well, it turns out that these two colors being what we would call complementary create a more striking visual to bees and other pollinators. So it was found that when these two are growing together, they get more pollinator interest than if either were growing alone. And so as we're making our plant list, I think it is really cool to look for these more intricate relationships between plants that are growing reciprocally between themselves and pollinators that are utilizing this. I also want to highlight that there is enough to go around for humans as well as other wildlife. So I think the use of plant medicine is growing, is having a revival right now and this idea of urban foraging. I do think it is important to harvest minimally 
so that the plants can still provide value to the wildlife that they're intended for. But I want to highlight that Nooka rose, along with other roses, create rose hips, which are really high in vitamin C. And these can be made into jellies or teas. We also have a beaked hazelnut, which is just like a hazelnut that you would buy. And then lastly, common yarrow has been used in ancient medicine for quite a long time for medicinal teas. I will say that it's very important that you do your research before eating any plant or berry before, just to be safe. But I think having knowledge of how these plants can be healing and how we may have evolved with these plants all along is really powerful and something that I don't think that we should see plants as only for other species. Next up, we have water. So you'll notice in this picture that we have varying heights because some birds really enjoy having a higher water source while others and insects need things to be lower and more accessible. It's important that we have shallow sides because we don't want things to drown. And having rough edges also is another preventative measure for animals and insects to not fall in too deep. I also wanna highlight insects again, because they're so important to our ecosystem. These are just two really simple ways that we can create water sources for insects that are safe by providing rocks for them that are sturdy to stand on and really shallow water that's easy for them to drink. Cover. So this is the third element that we need. So you'll see here that I bolded layered vegetation because having that complexity in habitat makes sure that we're serving all the species that need that cover. Brush piles are another way that we can provide when there's not a robust native plant situation yet that's just getting established. Brush is still really helpful just having, you know, maybe your yard waste in a a pile that allows for things to burrow. Roosting boxes and platforms can be constructed. However, they should be made specific to that, to a species that you have in mind to make sure that it's serving them properly. Rock piles are another way that we can create complexity in a habitat. And then insect hotels are something that can be constructed. So this diagram shows mainly birds, I think 100% birds, and how they utilize the various layers of a canopy. So complexity in the vegetation layering is helpful because it's mimicking how we see a forest structure. It also helps prevent soil erosion because as each layer is intercepting the velocity of rain, the impact on the ground creates less splash and less loss of soil. And increased diversity of plants means that there'll be an increased diversity of wildlife. You can see here all the different species of birds that are enjoying the various layers. So the first layer is the canopy. So that's the big trees like Douglas firs, big leaf maple, Western red cedar, Sitka spruce, and hardwoods like red alder. And then the shrub layer, which I think is one of the most important layers because Ken Davis, who is DNR stewardship wildlife biologist, says that nearly 25% of our forest dwelling wildlife rely on the shrubs for cover and would not exist on our lands without these wonderfully dense thickets. So not only do these provide food, but the density and the complexity of the shrub layer creates a lot of cover and safety for various species. When we have tall trees, they mainly have a canopy that's concentrated at the top, which doesn't allow for a whole lot of cover or complexity. So shrubs include Salmonberry, serviceberry, vine maple, 
twin berry, and oso berry. So just by the names, you can tell that a lot of those are not only providing cover, but also some food source. And then lastly, we have the ground layer, which is really important cover for insects and amphibians. So that would be ferns, strawberry, and false lily of the valley. So just to highlight two plants, the Nootka rose and other bushes that have thorns are especially helpful because it's just an extra layer of safety for critters. Um, and then the rose hips, not only do the flowers provide food in the form of nectar and pollen in the summer, but in the fall into winter, the rose hips persist, which are another food source for birds. Sword ferns are a very hardy plant for year round cover for amphibians and insects. They also provide nesting places for song sparrows and spotted towhees. Another great thing about sword ferns is that they're excellent for erosion control. So if you have a steep slope and you're in the understory, a sword fern is super hardy and adopts pretty well to new sites. Place to raise young. So as I talked about, we can bring in artificial things like nest boxes, which as I mentioned before, we should build these according to species characteristics and have an appropriately sized and shaped entrance and predator guards. So rather than just build a box in your workshop, it's important to research what birds that you're trying to support. It's also important to clean out and put away each nesting box at the end of the season so that unintended critters don't come in there and then bring it out before birds are ready to nest in the spring. Cover, as mentioned before, in the form of vegetation is really helpful for raising young. And pictured here is snowberry, which these white berries persist into the winter, which are a good late source of food for birds. Other dense vegetation includes salmonberry, which you'll often find in the understory of an alder forest. And similar to Nooka Rose, they have you know, smaller thorns, but still have some prickly thorns, which is really helpful. And when they get into a pretty big thicket, they're pretty impenetrable. So highly recommend for making sure that your shrub understory is a priority. Other places to raise young are bare ground. So Although we want to establish a really robust vegetation layer, there also is a time and place to leave some bare ground because approximately 70% of native bee species nest in the ground. Bunch grasses, which seem to be really common in landscaping right now, are another helpful thing for bumblebees because they can use the abandoned mouse holes and nest at the base of the bunch grass. And then it's also important to note not to trim until April after the bumblebee queens have left their overwintering spot. Snags. So snags are something that I've learned a lot about this year. They serve so many different kinds of wildlife from bats, birds, including woodpeckers, chickadees, wood ducks, insects, mammals, large and small. Basically anything you can think of can live in a snag. And approximately 30% of native bees nest in snags. So you often think, you know, when we're thinking about restoration and we're thinking about survivorship, there's this big priority placed on trees surviving. And Ken Babis of DNR says that sometimes trees actually provide more habitat for wildlife dead than when they're alive. And so I think there's something to be said about thinking about 
not just the importance of living things, but also the benefit and place for decomposition and death in our habitat to provide more life. Also, from a forestry perspective, say for your forest health, you need to thin, you could choose to just top a few trees rather than cutting them all down and create this really great habitat. This is also a good option if you have a hazard tree close to your home, which would also provide optimal habitat viewing really close, close up without the risk of a tree falling. Slopes. So one thing that can be kind of intimidating is establishing native plants in more tricky areas. But I do think it is really important to highlight planting on slopes to avoid erosion and loss of land. So you can see in this image how we've put in what we call live stakes, which are essentially a cutting of a stem of a plant that will then root into the ground. And they're put in at this angle and you can see how the roots are establishing, really holding onto that soil. But erosion control is not all about roots. It's also about having that layered vegetation to, to intercept the water as it falls. So again, same principles that we talked about, having diversity, having layering, and making sure that we're planting in the appropriate place in terms of moisture and sunlight will help get things established well on the slope. So I'd like to highlight some plants that are useful for slopes. Um, I don't think it's necessary for me to read through all of them, but I do wanna highlight that we have specific curated plant lists available on the Stohomish Conservation District website that can help you establish plants in your problem areas, whether it's your slopes or your wet areas or your dry areas, because we wanna make sure that we're getting plants in all the areas that you need. I also want to plug the use of live stakes because they're significantly cheaper to buy. They're a lot easier to install because you're basically sticking a stick into the ground and they do pretty well. I think the survivorship is pretty decent, especially if you're actively managing a small area. And most importantly, they have a very low impact on the soil. So it actually is worse for erosion if you're digging in to a big hole on the side of your slope to plant a potted plant rather than minimizing soil disruption by just sticking in a live stake. And then I also do wanna highlight that if you are doing a major, considering a major planting on a slope, we recommend consulting a geotechnical engineer just to make sure that you're not putting yourself at more risk rather than improving the habitat. I also wanna call attention to this recent die off of our Western red cedar. So this cedar pictured is absolutely dead, but sometimes you'll see in the fall, the Western red cedar gets this red flagging on the, on the edge of their foliage. And in most cases, cedars are not really suffering from a horrible tree disease or a pest, but that's them shedding their old foliage. So this is an annual thing that happens that's called cedar flagging. And it's a lot more noticeable this fall due to last summer's drought. But there are times when the cedar are just flat out dying. So some things we can do to prevent this is being more intentional with placement. As we have climate change creating increasing risk, we might think that we want to give up on these species that don't establish more readily or without as much effort. But the reality is Western red cedar and Douglas fir have a lot of genetic diversity and resilience. We just need to be a little bit more intentional on where we place them. So for cedars specifically, that would mean not putting it in full sun. It is not like that. 
putting it somewhere that is moist or consistently, at least consistently somewhat moist to wet. So when I'm talking about concavities where there might be a small divot or slope, that would actually be a great place to plant a cedar because that area would receive just even a little bit more moisture than other places. Another way you can retain moisture is using arborist chips or mulch to put in a ring around the cedar, which would help retain the moisture and also give more nutrients to that plant. Another thing you can do is try to face, have it on a north facing aspect. So this would receive even just a little bit less sun than a south facing. I also want to highlight water conservation. So being on an island, it's really important that we're conserving our resources and minimizing runoff. So some tools we can use to do this are drip irrigation in your gardens, being mindful of water use, planting a rain garden or a bog garden, planting buffers along streets or impermeable surfaces to absorb that water before it hits pavement and runs off into storm drains or wherever it runs off to. And then if possible, removing these hard surfaces so that there's more surface area for that water to infiltrate into the water table. I also wanna highlight that it's really important that in your site assessment, you look at where your drainage field is or septic tank. It's a hazard sometimes to even put plants over these because plants are really strong. So make sure you do your due diligence and check on these areas before you implement any planting plans or alter the landscape. I also wanna highlight the role of domestic animals in the landscape. So although we love our cats and dogs, it's really important that we don't let them just have free range over the wildlife. House cats kill an incredible amount of birds and reptiles and other things that we're trying to support. So if you do let your cat outside, at least keep an eye on them and just keep your dogs from chasing off the wildlife because we're here to kind of support and make them feel welcome to our space. Also windows. So it's really heartbreaking when you're in your home and a bird flies into your window and potentially dies. And it sounds like there'll be a presentation on this to go really in depth later on in the year. But a few things you can do is put up screens, which at least reduce the reflection and kind of get in the way of that illusion of it being an open space for the bird. Um, and then move your feeders and your bird baths and other things that are attracting birds at least 30 feet away from your home. That way the birds are feeling, they're not attracted to your window in any way. So that's what I have today. And I'd like to go through a few resources that I'll have sent out to everyone this evening. And then we'll have lots of time for some questions and we can really dig into any other topics that people are interested in. So I'd like to highlight I won't go through all of these, but the Washington Native Plant Society and the King County Native Plant Guide are really great places to start when you're looking at plants for different soil and light conditions and planning your planting plan. Um, the big highlight here is Nohomish Conservation District's plant sale. And our pre-sale is opening up very soon. So visit our website and take a look at our inventory. The plant sale pre-order is happening in January and then the pickup will be March 5th and 6th in Monroe. I also wanna highlight these pollinator focused resources that talk about ways that we can support our pollinators and make sure our plants are tailored to all the various insects that are important to our ecosystem. Also, the bottom bullet here is a rain garden handbook 
So if you do have an area that is pulling a lot of water, that might be a good site for a rain garden. And Snohomish Conservation District has someone who specializes in rain garden creation and design. So we're here to support. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has a really great website that has information on backyard wildlife habitat, a lot more in-depth information about snags and the creation of snags to benefit. And then they have some fact sheets for not just wildlife, but also some plants. WSU Master Gardeners are a really great resource. They have a lot of experience implementing planting plans and making sure things are tailored to the landscape. And then lastly, Snohomish Conservation District, which can provide a free site visit to, to you and get your needs met. We have a lot of resources on our website. And like I said, the native plant sale is happening. The pre-orders are opening next week. And that's all I have. Questions? So you can, go, you can add your, your questions in the chat or you can ask, you can unmute and ask. Thank you, Mariah. It was great. Yeah, it was fabulous. Um, I'm Susan, and I just want to know what your definition of slope is. Yeah, I, I don't have a very specific definition, but I do think a slope is an incline that is creating any flow of water or making it difficult for vegetation to establish naturally on its own. Does that answer your question? So we have some questions in the chat. Can you see the chat, Mariah, or do you want me to read them to you? I am unable to see the chat. If you okay. could see them, that would be great. Okay, so Jennifer wants to know if you have a plant list of deer resistant plants or even a list of plants that are good for deer. Yes, I feel like the conservation district does have a, a few plants. I don't have them off the top of my head, but that is something that we can pull together and get sent out. Do you think that that's listed in the, um, I know the plant sale has the really good resources tell us about each specific plant. Do, do they list for each plant if it's attractive to deer, or mostly deer resistant? I know there's nothing deer proof. Russell Link's book does. Russell Link's book has a chart about um, what certain, um, it's kind of a chart on what, what certain birds like and what keeps the, the deer, what the deer don't like um, in the living with landscaping for wildlife and in the living with wildlife he has a whole deer section in that those books are available from the snow isle libraries so you don't you know if it's something that you think that you might just use as a resource but you don't need a copy of you can check them out and they're readily available and they used to have a have some of it online you could to find out about different things um and then it wasn't there and i don't know if it's back i haven't checked in a while but but those two books because it's it's, it's real local for pacific northwest especially washington that's helpful yeah so, i think that the, the charts in the back really are fabulous mm -hmm. and kathleen yeah. go ahead Oh, I was just going to say that I know that I did include deer resistant in some of the plant descriptions on the plant sale website, but I don't, I don't know if you're able to filter for that, but I can try to make that a tag to filter for. Oh, that'd be great. So Kathleen wants to know what it says to help nesting birds, especially hummingbirds. Um, 
I guess she would like to put out a container with mosses and twigs. Is that helpful and when should she do that? I don't know if I know enough about birds to answer that one. Does anyone else on the panel have an idea? We've got some excellent birders in the audience. If uh, maybe Pam would like to speak up. I would say don't put out string. I've heard some people put out string for birds, but um, that not necessarily hummingbirds, although they might use it. But uh, even though birds can use it, the string, the cotton and synthetics do not do birds any, any favors. They need to be using natural materials. So I would, and then the birds can get tangled and die. So please don't put out the string. Maybe somebody can add um, on down to the chat. Um, we've got some thank yous. Do you encourage bunnies too? So this is one of the, the myths we have about, um, I know my neighbors said once they didn't want to create, they didn't want to be certified as a, a habitat, certified habitat, because they thought that meant you had to encourage deer and, and rabbits and all kinds of pests with things that they consider pests. And you, so you don't have to, that's, it's not a sanctuary, a, a wildlife habitat is not a sanctuary for all animals. You can gently discourage <laughs> the ones that you don't want and um, and definitely encourage the ones you do. But um, I love bunnies. I think they're really fun and I, they do get in my garden and I don't like that, but I love watching them. Uh, does anybody else have comments about bunnies? Well, just on, on what people think of as nuisances, like that we had one speaker who she um her way to deal with slugs was she planted some things that slugs liked and they stayed and so they went for that and it was kind of mixed up with some of the things that she liked and she but the slugs like the other stuff that she planted purposely for the slugs mm -hmm. um and there's a book called gaia's garden and he had a a hedge that had like two sides and and there was the deer side and his side and i don't know if um the deer went along with that, but that was the intent that it was it was a mix of of what deer would like, so that they went for that, and then they didn't go for the stuff that he wanted to make sure was there. So it's think it's it's thinking about you know, it's it's the connectedness that Mariah is talking about. You can you can kind of do a little mix there for for both um, both groups and what they like. So they're not nuisances; they're just participants in the garden. Do you have any suggestions on containment of Nutka rose after it's been planted and sending runners everywhere? I know I, I'm seeing that too. I just kind of pull up the runners and sometimes I re put them somewhere else. Do you have specific comments? I do think that sometimes cutting things back can almost prov promote it growing faster but it is a temporary option. I think if you really want to decrease the size, you would have to go to the roots and dig up an edge. I guess that is also a caution when you're planting these shrubs and more thicket forming plants to look at the area you intend because they will spread pretty rapidly and create a lot of density as we're hearing. So yeah, I, I'm very careful about which plants I plant where and try to look and see if they if they do do the runners runner thing because it's really great when you want the thicket but it's not great if you want a specimen plant. Uh, what do you do at a site visit is one of the questions. Do you have suggestions of native plants or what else do you do on site visits? We do all kinds of things. It really depends on whatever your goals are and we try to meet and tailor that. Um, sometimes we come out and help people, we advise people on their planting plan or how to manage their steep slopes or what they should do about the stream that's running through their property, all kinds of things, but we definitely provide guidance on planting plans and can send out resources. Did that answer your question, Katie, or do you have um, another follow-up question for that? 
Um, um, if you, if you go ahead, we've got someone who's raised their hand, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, yeah, um, this is Zinnia. I actually have a follow up to this site, a site visit one. So is, is this, a, you know, like you said that um, Snohomish conservation will come and help. Is this something that like you could do an initial visit to help figure out, you know, what you wanted to do. And then later after you've done some things, ask for another one, you know, I, I just wondered how, like how, how much can we, ask for help kind of thing? That's a good question. Yeah, I I know that we've done some returning site visits and um, I think it really depends on the nature of what what we're trying to achieve. But yeah, this is a free service for, for you and we're okay. here to support. Okay, thank you. Katie uh, says, I had a hummingbird next door and they picked off all the moss and made a small nest. Good reminder to check before trimming because it was small. Yeah, that's, it's really very um, concerning when you start cleaning up your landscape and all of a sudden you run into bird nests. So do your cleaning before the birds nest. Do you have other comments on that, Mariah? Not really, I one comment, I do have is I talked a lot about native plants, but also I think it's important to mention non-native plants. And my neighbor has a huge English holly and I'm seeing so many hummingbirds and other birds flock to that. And so I think it is mindful too about, you know, as we're attracting wildlife, how are we limiting the spread of these invasive plants that can take over the whole landscape? So just wanted to make sure that was said as well. So Catherine says chicken wire around new plants keeps them safe until they're large enough to handle, until they are large enough to handle browsing. Yeah, that's a good, good comment about the deer uh, or bunnies or whatever. Um, Catherine says site visits can also be done to help with drainage and flooding issues or rainwater catchment. You guys have a lot of different specialties. When is it best to do your birdhouse cleaning? Again, if someone more experienced with birds wants to take this one, I'm a little unsure. This is Catherine. I, we don't, well, we don't always get around to it, but generally in the fall after they're done um, or uh, winter time, because uh, yellow jacket queens will often find uh, bird nests house bird houses to be a good place to overwinter. So um, if you clean out the nest in the winter while they're sleeping, then you can uh, relocate the, the yellow jacket queen um, without risk to yourself and then hang up the um, nest box right before the, the breeding season of the bird that you're interested in. Any final questions? There are. It looks like um, Brock, Roxy, are you able to? Handle yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't okay. realize I had muted myself because I was. Ah, uh, yeah. What is the first step in converting a lawn into a native landscape? That is an excellent question. There's a lot of. There's definitely a few different approaches. I think. One is depending on, I think the main factor is scale. So how large of a space is this? Do you want to just scrape the, I think removing the grass, scraping the grass is a good approach. I know a lot of people recommend herbicide, but I do think that that is not super helpful when we're trying to support wildlife. So I think just really trying to scrape that top layer because also when we're establishing native vegetation after it's previously grass, grass has basically evolved to take up all that water. So it's creating a lot of competition with native plants. So I do think even if you don't want to remove all of the grass at once, 
creating these islands of bare soil that allow the native plants to compete will be really important for it being successful. We have go a number of questions, a number of comments. Thank you. And um, on the on the lawn, though, we have a handout on that, so I can um, I can give it oh. to Roxy to okay. um, to put in in the mailing with the recording. Okay. Yeah, and we'll the, do that. And the other thing is that it it's 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 something that you don't have to do the whole thing. Like, like in my pre my little blurb at the beginning, it's like we did sections, and before we did the strips. The big lawn strips in the front we had little boxes of like like planting boxes that we did first and then we took care of the like one side of the path and then the other side of the path but we did things before we even did the the larger scale so it's it's like it, it's a work in progress always yeah don't don't get overwhelmed because then you might not start do a little bit at a time so kathleen mentions lasagna that a lasagna method for grass where you lay layers of newspaper or cardboard over the grass and then dirt on top. What do you think of that, Mariah? Yeah, that's definitely an option. I think suppressing the grass and then building up is definitely one approach that I've seen used before. It's a lot less work. Um, <laughs> that's always something. Something in its favor. All right, any any other, con oh, would thick leaf cover kill off a lawn? I, I don't think it would by itself. Um, Christine says she's also a huge fan of the braiding sweet, sweet grass and she's wondering if you're planning other, any other presentations based on that book. Not that I know of, I kind of took the, the freedom of adding that into this presentation. So I'm really happy to hear that it was well received. 